Uh, thank you uh, uh, both for a very glowing uh, and generous introduction. Uh, it's quite an honor to be uh, invited here to give the Ersted lecture. Um, and I've had a very, uh, very pleasant day visiting different laboratories and department heads. Um, a very fascinating uh, research going on. Um, so let me start uh, and just mention uh, Hans Christian Ersted. Uh, he, uh, he actually was brought up by uh, German foster parents without a formal education, came here uh, to the university and uh, with his brother Anas, uh, both of them got admitted on the basis of the performance on their uh, entrance exam. Graduated here and then uh, some years later became a, a professor, uh, but only after having been out for a few years and he gave popular lectures uh, all over Copenhagen, I'm told, for which people actually paid uh, admission to come listen to. Yeah, so there's a can at the door on your way out. <laughs> um, yeah, but I know him from the discovery that electricity and magnetism are intimately related. Uh, of course, he did other work. He was a chemist, uh, discovered aluminum. Uh, but I know him for electricity and magnetism. Uh, I like this image of Hans Christian because he looks a bit rakish in this image. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Ersted satellite, it's a Danish uh, small satellite program launched in 99, still functioning. Um, the development for that, the technology, the instrumentation, uh, developed a few buildings from here uh, by my colleagues. Um, so I think Hans Christian, of course, would have been very proud of that. And, uh, and I think he would probably enjoy uh, today's lecture, which is on one of his favorite subjects, magnetism. Um, I'm going to talk about the magnetic field of Mars. Uh, this is a, an image of the Mars Global Surveyor satellite. It, is it possible to, to dim the adjacent uh, lights a little bit? Or can you see that fine from where you are? Well, um, this uh, satellite went into orbit uh, 96. You can see on the outer edge of the satellite, we have two magnetic sensors at the end of the solar panels. Um, and that was in large part uh, a response to an earlier mission failure, Mars Observer. It failed to get into orbit. And so we had to go on a smaller spacecraft a few years later. Uh, Mario Acuna was the, uh, the PI and the, and the engineering genius behind our magnetometers. And he figured out a way to put them on the solar panels and backwire the panels so they wouldn't affect our measurement. What you see out here, that's a, that's a drag flap. Uh, part of this mission design was to actually circularize the orbit by going through the atmosphere, uh, losing a, a few meters per second of velocity with each pass. And that gradually brings down the apoapsis of the orbit. Um, this illustration shows you how Mars Global Surveyor um, entered into orbit. It was uh, uh, basically a dawn-dusk orbit to begin with. This illustration shows the solar wind um, uh, passing by Mars a few hundred kilometers uh, per second, the highly ionized plasma that blows off of the sun. Uh, and you see it disturbs the magnetic field in the environment, but it can't really penetrate the Mars atmosphere. And it shapes a cavity, a quiet cavity, a wake behind the planet. So with one of our first passes uh, over the crust of Mars, we detected a very strong magnetic field. And what this illustration shows is that a time history of the magnetic field vectors along the trajectory of Mars Global Surveyor as it passed over the surface at a little more than 100 kilometers altitude. And uh, every three seconds along the trajectory, we draw a vector. And that vector shows you the magnetic field that we measured as we passed over the surface. And so with this one first image, uh, you learn so many things about Mars. Uh, if I back up for a second, you see there's, there's no magnetic field along this part of the trajectory, or at least an insignificant magnetic field, just the small and variable magnetic field of the solar wind. Um, but you don't see the global uh, magnetic field, such as the Earth has, uh, the field due to a dynamo deep in the interior. So you know that Mars today has no dynamo, no global magnetic field. But you also know that Mars has a magnet 
uh, or many magnets in the crust, buried in the crust beneath your view. And each one of these, whoops, back up. Each one of these vectors, uh, the magnitude here, the peak magnitude is about 400 nanoteslas. If you were to fly a satellite over the Earth's crust, and if you could turn off the magnetic field of the Earth so that the large global field disappeared, the largest signal you would measure would be about the size of the arrowhead on the top of this vector. So already you know that the crust of Mars is intensely magnetized, insanely intensely magnetized compared to our experience on Earth. So another way to look at this is we'll look at a, at a map of the surface in latitude and longitude. And each time we have an arrow breaking pass, a close pass over the surface, we'll pick up a paintbrush and we'll paint with a pigment scaled to the magnetic field along that trajectory. And we'll only do that when the spacecraft is below 200 kilometers. So at the beginning of one of these passes, it's at 200 kilometers, it goes down to periapsis, and then 200 again. And we paint the field red if it's positive and blue if it's negative in radial. And you can see that, that this uh, is not just one magnetic anomaly, but you have several scattered about. Um, and of course, if the trajectory is further from the surface, it broadens your view, so you can't resolve uh, as well as an adjacent lower trajectory. But you get the impression that, that beneath this crust of Mars are buried some extensive, uh, extensively magnetized uh, crust. And so uh, you'd like to understand what this material is. You'd like to characterize it somehow. And one way to do that is to do source modeling. And so uh, most of you at the university have probably had this course. Uh, you can compute what the magnetic field is due to buried objects. This is a sphere. Um, if it's magnetized in horizontal direction, you can compute VZ and VX. You do the same for a infinite uh, line of dipoles or, or a magnetized cylinder. And you can do the same for a slab. Um, and then the game is you try to characterize the source by matching your, your data to a model prediction. Of course, there are questions. You need some information. You need to know, you need to know some constraints about where the material is, is buried or how extensively distributed it is. Um, and so it's not a very satisfying experience. This is a, uh, an illustration of four passes uh, over that magnetized area. This is the, uh, the X component of the field for these four passes. And the, um, uh, the data here is the uh, yellow line and the model fit, which uses a few buried objects. It's not all that satisfactory, uh, but it gives you an impression of the magnitude of the moments you need. Uh, and the best fit here says you need to bury something 20 kilometers, and it needs 10 to the 16 amp meter squared moment. OK, so that's a pretty serious moment. Um, 10 to the 16 amp meters, if you had 10 amp meter material, you'd need 100 kilometer, something on the order of 100 kilometer sphere. And of course, we're only buried 20 kilometers. So that says that you're talking about a much larger volume of material than, uh, than is modeled here. So uh, as we continued with aerobraking, breaking, we passed over and over and over uh, the surface of Mars again. And now this is in the uh, southern hemisphere, the very intensely magnetized southern hemisphere. And again, we're playing that game where we, we use a brush, and the pigment of which is scaled again to the magnetic field. Whoops. Uh, and we're going from 1,500 now to minus 1,500 nanoteslas. And we're looking at a number of passes over the surface. Here's where it was at 200 kilometers, periapsis back up to 200 kilometers. And you can compare adjacent passes. This one was at a lower altitude, so it resolves two stripes here in the uh, Southern Highlands. This pass was at a slightly higher altitude, and so it can no longer resolve both stripes. It just sees a broad red stripe. But that's how a potential field behaves. The further away you get from something, the longer wavelengths will dominate. The shorter wavelengths will be attenuated. And so we have all of these passes, and it's abundantly clear that 
uh, the entire crust of Mars is actually magnetized, intensely magnetized. And again, 1,500 nanoteslas uh, is an unimaginably large signal to measure from satellite altitude. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was first pulling these up in my office, um, one of the very famous geophysicists from the 1960s and 70s that studied uh, uh, marine seafloor anomalies uh, shook his head and said, that can't be real. It's your instrument. It's the spacecraft. It is not real. And, and that's how extraordinary uh, the signal magnitude is at Mars. It's unbelievable uh, to people that study the Earth. Uh, so here again is that uh, is one of those passes that I just pointed out. And I like to show this because it's just so beautiful. The spacecraft, again, passing over the surface. And uh, of course, at higher altitude here and periapsis altitude down here. And as it passes over the surface, the field just kind of corkscrews around and around and around as seen in projection uh, in a plane observed from the sun. Uh, just a, a very remarkable uh, measurement that you can't duplicate uh, about any other planet. And so um, we can apply some source modeling techniques to this data. And this illustration just shows you uh, the kind of model uh, that we applied to the data. Um, here is the MGS spacecraft moving along its trajectory. And the maximum altitude, or the minimum altitude, is about 100 kilometers. It varies from pass to pass, but that's how deep into the atmosphere uh, you want to go to slow the spacecraft down uh, to circularize the orbit. And we were in aerobraking for well over a year, um, in large part because of a, uh, an issue with the spacecraft that uh, caused us to aerobrake in a much more conservative manner, just a few meters per second each time. Uh, for us, it was, uh, it was great. Uh, instead of having uh, less than 100 aero braking passes, now we had 1,000 and more. Uh, so this model has uh, slabs of uniformly magnetized material stretching in the east-west direction. And the magnetization is just kind of schematically um, indicated here. And we said, OK, we'll make the slab 30 kilometers thick. Uh, we can't imagine magnetizing more than that. Uh, in fact, that's probably a great stretch. But in order to get a believable magnetization intensity, we wanted to get that as deep as we could. Um, and so this is the model. And um, we put that into a, an inverse program, a multivariate uh, inverse program. Uh, we use a technique, a, general in, a generalized inverse technique that utilizes a singular, de a de singular value decomposition of Lankos. Uh, and I only show this uh, simply because uh, it, it, it's always been uh, my belief that to find the best fitting model is really not good enough. You have to understand the uniqueness of your model fit. You want to know what other models are close to your models that might be equally good uh, to fit the data. And so if you have any questions here on inverse theory, you can ask Thorburn. Uh, because he's been uh, schooled in the technique. Uh, so uh, we do this model inverse, and we're trying to figure out what kind of magnetization intensities and directions would be consistent with our observations. And so here there are an example of two passes. This is the uh, X component up here for one pass, pass seven on day 20 in 99. This is the Z component. Uh, the other component is really quite small, and that already tells you that you're looking at something of infinite extent in east-west direction. Um, here's another pass, uh, pass six. Uh, again, the x component and the z component as a function of distance uh, along the, an arbitrarily uh, centered center point at about uh, 50 some odd degrees uh, south latitude. And then here we're showing the uh, magnetization uh, in x direction and in the z direction uh, for both of these passes. And the model fit is in red. Uh, and you can see the model does a very good job of explaining the observations. Um, and so for us, um, 
this data was very reminiscent of the kind of observations that we, uh, that we saw in the 1960s when uh, ships towed magnetometers across the mid-ocean ridge. Um, and so that actually was a very exciting time in geophysics. I'm sure many of you have studied that. Uh, this is a famous paper by Vine and Matthews uh, describing the, um, the lineated magnetic anomalies uh, that are uh, adjacent to a mid-ocean ridge. And up until this time, Alfred Wegener's uh, continental drift ideas were not widely accepted in geophysics. He proposed continental drift back in 1905, I think published uh, an extensive manuscript in 1910. Um, and he was largely ridiculed uh, over the decades in between. The whole idea of continents plowing through terra firma was, uh, was preposterous. And um, these observations were really among the first where geophysicists uh, uh, came into the field and, uh, and really turned around the entire community and the acceptance of the unifying theory of plate tectonics from this point on was a foregone conclusion. Of course, um, seafloor spreading uh, is, uh, is part of plate tectonics. This is how the Earth makes new crust. It comes up at a mid-ocean ridge say in the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean are good examples. Um, as, the, uh, as the magma comes up from below, from the mantle, and it spreads out to the left and right of the ridge, it cools off. And as it cools through the Curie temperature, it becomes, acquires the magnetization imprint of the current magnetic field of the Earth. And of course, fortunately, the Earth's magnetic field reverses in polarity a few times every million years. And because it reverses in polarity a few times every million years, as this crust evolves away from the mid-ocean ridge, it acquires a polarity that at one time is normal, i.e. the direction of the field today. Uh, at another time, it's reversed. And it goes through this, normal reverse, normal reverse. And uh, I guess in years past, this used to be described as uh, kind of a tape recorder. But of course, people don't use tape recorders anymore, so that does not going to work. Uh, so we'll have to call it a conveyor belt that uh, constantly generates new crust. The crust moves away from the mid-ocean ridge, and it carries with it the magnetic imprint imposed upon it by the uh, existing dipole field. OK, so it is part of this grand machine that remakes the Earth over and over and over again, recycles uh, the Earth's crust. So this machine uh, is driven with new crust here. Uh, the lithosphere, that's the, that's the hard part, the outer shell of the, uh, of the, of the Earth, um, that moves away from the ridge. And of course, if you're creating new crust and it's moving, you have to destroy it somewhere. And so that happens at a subduction zone. Uh, the crust is subducted, in this case, beneath the continents. And as it is subducted, you have uh, melting, partial melting in the subducted crust. It has carried with it ocean sediments. It has more nitrogen in it, has more water in it. All of this stuff is evolved. And it shows up uh, as plumes, uh, plutons, uh, intrusions, and volcanics that line the subduction zones. And so um, this is Vine again. Uh, you recognize that this is a global phenomenon, that the seafloor spreading occurs many places around the globe. And where, wherever it occurs, it will record the same time history of the Earth's field reversals. So this is all very exciting. So we look at this data from Mars, and it is so very reminiscent of the data that we acquired in the 60s that led to this uh, new theory of, of the Earth, um, that it just seemed almost too good to be true. And so we, of course, proposed that uh, seafloor spreading had created these lineations in the crust of Mars. So this is just an illustration of all of the plates uh, that we know of on Earth. Uh, various size plates. There are about a dozen major plates. There are lots of 
bunch of little ones. Um, this East Pacific rise, this is a spreading center here in the Pacific, spreading center threading the entire uh, Atlantic, uh, where the material is uh, extruded. And then here, uh, examples of subduction uh, beneath the continent of South America. And of course, all the volcanics, the so-called ring of fire, uh, trace out where these plates are being subducted and where the material is coming up uh, in volcanics. Uh, almost the same image can be, uh, can be made using seismicity. Well, the earthquakes also trace out uh, the plates, the plate boundaries and where the plates are being subducted. And so this really is the unifying uh, theory of the, how the Earth works and how it evolved. Uh, the Earth today is made by this process and uh, everything we enjoy on the continents uh, came uh, up through the crust. This is an example of magnetic pattern. This was first published by uh, Raff and Mason, 1961. Uh, and, and here, the normal fields are black, reverse fields are white. And you can see it's, it's kind of a very complicated picture. There's obvious lineations throughout the entire picture, obvious stripes everywhere, but it's kind of hard to figure out because there's lots of faults going on, a lot of faulting, and of course, uh, off to the right, you have another uh, copy of this image where somebody has very generously gone and uh, painted colors uh, for the age of the crust. And now you can see, oh, okay, well, this is the spreading center here. There's a little bit of faulting going on, as evidenced by a displacement in the magnetic field pattern. Um, a little bit of faulting going on here as well. This is another uh, ridge axis and the material is coming off in either direction over here. Uh, so even though the, the diagram I showed you is rather simple, in reality, when you look at the geology of it, it gets a little more complicated, but it's still there. This is a, is a plot of the very same area. This is the magnetic field. These are the, the stripes I had just shown you uh, in black and white that Raff and Mason uh, originally mapped out in 1961. Oh, so you might ask yourself, well, they saw this pattern in 1961, and it took until 1963 before you know, somebody had an explanation for it. Um, the most popular explanation for those stripes at the time was that uh, it must have had something wrong with his instrument, again. So a lot of people didn't believe the Raff and Mason's magnetic stripes. Uh, too bad, because they missed an opportunity. Uh, but I want to show this one because you see throughout the whole ocean crust here, you see these lineations. And the characteristic scale size, the width is about 10 kilometers or so. And just by coincidence, the depth of the ocean is perfect for measuring magnetic stripes with that scale size, because the depth of the ocean is a couple of, couple of kilometers. And you want to be uh, at, a, at an altitude where you can resolve these 10 kilometer stripes. If the, if the oceans had been 20 kilometers deep, these stripes would not have been resolved. You would just see the average magnetization. So it's a, uh, an interesting coincidence that the ocean is just the right depth to make this obvious to anyone. The other thing I like about this figure is it shows you this is the continental United States right here. This is the uh, western United States. And I think you can very clearly see that there is a, a, uh, a coherent pattern of magnetization over here. And there is a very incoherent, splotchy, random sort of pattern of pluses and minuses to the right. Now clearly, if you want to measure a large signal, you want to line all your magnets up so they point in the same direction, right? Because if they're all pointing in different directions, by the time you get far away, you're going to have a very weak signal. So the fact that we have such strong signals at Mars is really the first clue that you need a mechanism. You need a machine that is very efficient at generating magnetization throughout the entire crust and generating it in a coherent orientation. Many of my colleagues have not appreciated that somehow. Um, here's another example, a famous example, probably more familiar to you because it's 
between Greenland and Denmark. Uh, this is the magnetic stripes uh, off of uh, Iceland, which sits on a uh, mid-ocean ridge. And this is another famous example from that era. And I think this is a later paper by uh, Fred Vine as well. OK, so uh, with all of this, um, we are pretty firm in our belief that uh, this kind of a pattern that you see is, uh, is basically anal analogous to the seafloor spreading on Earth. That this must have happened on Mars. It must have happened um, a long time ago, because we can still see the cratered uh, pockmarks on Mars. And it requires uh, a magnetization, uh, average magnetization over the entire crust that is some 20 times uh, the intensity of the Earth's magnetization. Uh, so you have to have a very good process for doing it. Uh, so I'm going to skip on now and go to the orbital observations. We finally uh, finished aero braking. We got Mars Global Surveyor into a nice circular orbit. Um, and, uh, and you can see it spends half of its time in that nice quiet wake of Mars. And so uh, over many, many years, we accumulate all of that data and uh, try to make a magnetic map over the entire surface now of Mars. This is just an illustration to show you how good the signal to noise is for individual passes that we make over the night side. Uh, this is a collection of passes within a half a degree of the same place on the surface. And you see that they lie one on top of each other. Um, but for a little bit of a displacement sometimes where the field is weak, that displacement is simply due to the interaction of the solar wind with the planet. And what it does is it just gives you an offset to the magnetic field. So if the solar wind is strong, it might be offset over the entire pass. So that says, OK, so a good thing to do is, is I'll take the difference in the magnetic field from one point to the next along the trajectory. And that way, you get rid of any of this solar wind offset to improve the signal to noise even more. Um, you can show that the difference in radial field along track is going to look pretty much like the theta component of the field. Yeah, I won't bother to go into that in much detail. Uh, but I want to get to the map right away and show you what it looks like. So this now is a map of the measured magnetic field in every 1 half by 1 half degree pixel over the surface of Mars. We've color contoured this map with the magnitude of that delta BR d theta. And it's over uh, more than two orders of magnitude in dynamic range. So the signal to noise in this map is over a couple of hundred. You can see immediately that it's, it's coherent over the entire uh, surface of Mars. There are a couple of places where, OK, maybe adjacent pixels aren't the same color, and maybe there's a little bit of noise left in there. Uh, but the, the stunning thing that you see right away is that this map of crustal magnetism actually uh, correlates with the geology of Mars that we know about. Because beneath this map of magnetic field, we put a, a shaded topography map of Mars. And you can recognize the, the Tharsis Mons. You can re recognize large Olympus Mons, Elysium, large volcanic. All these are volcanic emplacements. Uh, the Utopia Planitia, this is a, a large plain. It may have been due to an impact, or it may have just been a flooded basin. Uh, Isidus, Hellas, Argyre, two large impacts in the southern hemisphere. And these are all non-magnetic, or nearly so. And so the hypothesis is that after the crust of Mars was magnetized, you had some large late impacts, Hellas and Argyre, and they remagnetized or demagnetized uh, the magnetic field of the crust where the impact occurred. They may have just scrambled up the coherence of the magnetization. That's another alternative. But at least at satellite height, there's no magnetic field present above these features. Wherever there have been large volcanic emplacements, kilometers of of 600 degree you know, basaltic lava emplaced uh, on the crust of Mars. Uh, wherever that happened, the magnetization is gone. And so that also suggests that the volcanic emplacements have heated up the crust and demagnetized the crust after the, uh, the demise of the dynamo. OK. Uh, you can also see uh, some features here. There's a well-known fault system that lines up with the magnetic field. And of course, we're going to look for more things that we can interpret in the, uh, this image of the magnetic field. 
Oh, let me go back. Before I move on, uh, I have a, uh, I've put uh, these dashed lines here. These two dashed lines are a small circle of rotation about a common axis. And that's uh, uh, significant uh, in that it looks like this volcanic activity, uh, there's another volcano up here, uh, a very fluid uh, uh, effusive material here that spread out a lot. But, uh, but there, a great many volcanic constructs occur along this small circle. And then uh, the same thing just to the north from Olympus Mons to Alba Patera. And so one way that happens on Earth, there are two good ways that you can line up volcanoes on Earth, and both of them have something to do with plate tectonics. So uh, the first way is the uh, Hawaiian and Emperor Seamount chain. Here's the Hawaiian Islands here. The Hawaiian Islands exist today over a hot spot in the mantle. But that plate has been pushed over that hot spot. So if you go away from Hawaii, there's a whole chain of uh, volcanic emplacements here that happened in the past. And this is some uh, 27 million years ago, some 7 million years ago. So over 2,600 kilometers, this hot spot in the crust has been popping up and generating islands. And so that's one way you can get a linear chain of islands that align to a circle of rotation about a common axis because uh, the motion of a plate um, has to follow a small circle of rotation. So we think that's a good explanation for those volcanoes. Uh, now, another feature that got our attention is right here in Meridiani, this whole section here, we can recognize a few lineated magnetic features that um, have an unusual property. This pattern of red and blue that represent different polarities of the magnetic field is similar to this pattern here and similar to this pattern here except it looks like you had to take this pattern and stretch it a little bit. These curves are also small circles about a uh, axis of rotation, the same axis of rotation. And if you find a magnetic imprint where you can see the offset here and offset below, and that offset occurs in different directions on either side of a center. So if this were a mid-ocean ridge, you explain this with faster spreading rate north here than over here, and faster spreading rate down this way than over here. So this feature where the magnetic pattern is the, needs to be stretched in one direction on one side of a fault and in the other direction on the other side of the axis, that's a distinctive, unique characteristic of plate tectonics. It's found nowhere else. It's the only way you can get that magnetic pattern. So that encourages us that uh, perhaps we are on the right track. Uh, we can look at that in a little more detail here. This is just a blow up of the same thing. Um, and I think you can convince yourself that indeed uh, you can create that pattern by simply stretching the, the center one. It also passes the test that the field on one side of this, uh, of this long uh, fault has to look like the field on the other side as long as you uh, allow for a little bit of stretching. And so that's what we've done. And uh, just show you that the curves line up. OK. So uh, if you have a fault like that that is on a small circle of rotation, this is a famous paper by uh, Jason Morgan, uh, again in the 60s. And he demonstrated that if you have two plates in relative motion on a sphere, they must be separated by a small circle of rotation about a common axis. And these features are called transform faults. This is a spreading center, transform fault, spreading center, transform fault. And you can explain much of what you see in the world's ocean uh, with this kind of a schematic model. So here we have a ridge axis, and we have large transform faults that span almost the entire Pacific. And oddly enough, they're separated by about 1,300 kilometers which is about the same separation of these two putative transform faults we found in the magnetic pattern on Mars. Uh, it may be a characteristic feature. Uh, uh, you know, as this material evolves from a spreading center, it's, uh, it starts out hot, and it's cooling. As it cools, it sinks a little bit. And as it cools, it shrinks. It sinks and shrinks. The shrinking process can only be accommodated by cracks. And apparently, 1,300 kilometers is a good um, spatial scale for this cracking to occur. OK, so in this map, 
uh, we have great evidence for the volcanic uh, modification of the magnetization of the crust of Mars. It's pretty compelling. Um, we can see major impacts uh, that have demagnetized much of the crust of Mars. There's a weak magnetic signature beneath the northern lowlands. At one time, people thought the northern lowlands were smooth because it was the uh, ocean floor. I think it's more likely they're simply smooth because it's a large basaltic flow, kilometers de deep at a time. And in fact, the geomorphologists have looked at, at this and they can see how you fill craters with, with basaltic lava. And they've concluded that these flows are a single emplacements of kilometer or more of, of basaltic lava. Of course, that's what you need to demagnetize the crust beneath. If it's a series of thin emplacements, the heat gets away. So uh, that story is all good, but it would imply the magnetization is close to the surface, not 30 kilometers deep, but a few kilometers deep. And that makes the intensity of magnetization even more uh, outrageous than it was when I started this discussion. OK, we also see a lot of east-west trending lineations. We see what we. Uh, we think are transform faults in the shifted magnetic pattern. We see a lot of the unique signatures of plate tectonics in this image of the crust of Mars. So uh, when we look at the crust of Mars today, it bears the magnetic imprint that it carried when it formed some four billion years ago. Um, and if we're lucky, uh, we can look at this pattern and figure out actually how Mars evolved in the, the final days of plate tectonics. Uh, now, last year, there was a paper published by An Yin at UCLA, uh, and he also used uh, the other way that you can explain a linear chain of volcanoes with plate tectonics. You do it with a subducting slab, like the slab that subducts beneath South America, for example. And so he, whoops. He has a slab subducting here. And of course, uh, you get melting, you get volcanics, and you create all of the Tharsis volcanoes. Uh, at a later time, the, the hinge axis for the subducting slab moves back in time. And so he uses that to create a second line of uh, volcanoes, uh, Olympus Mons and Alba Patera. So the only two explanations that uh, have really been put forward for why the volcanoes on Mars are curiously aligned uh, the way they are. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, either way has to do with plate tectonics. Uh, and th this actually was also proposed by Norm Sleep uh, back in uh, the mid-1990s. OK, uh, another illustration from An Yin. Um, in his paper last year in Lithosphere, he showed through an extensive geologic analysis that um, he could take the largest um, fault system in the universe, this uh, Valles Marinara, many thousands of kilometers long, um, he could reconstruct that by looking at a set of features on either side of the fault. And in order to make them match up, he needs to slide Valles Marinara, the southernmost part, to the left. And in doing so, you can close up this large canyon here, or uh, Graben system. But this uh, Velis Marineris has long been described as a continental rift, Look, looked like a continental rift. But of course, since Mars didn't have plate tectonics, it couldn't be a continental rift. But it looked just like one. And, and the reason it looks just like it is because it's arched like this. And it has multiple parallel grabbins. You can see more up here, more up here. It looks like what you get when you stretch the Earth's crust apart. Notice here, too, it's got 136 degree uh, angle between this fault system and this fault system. So that's kind of curious. Um, here's another um, illustration from An he put together for, uh, from a talk. This is the, uh, the Red Sea fault system um, and the, uh, where the Arabian plate and the African plate meet. There's a motion along this fault, but it's due to the separation of the Red Sea here. It's parting under uh, the tangential stress this direction, this direction. And oddly enough, at 136 degrees, that seems to be the characteristic angle of a continental rift. In fact, um, in that same part of the world, the most famous rift system here, the East Africa rift system, uh, this looks like a failed attempt at pulling the continent apart. Uh, this is part of the system here. This is the one we just looked at, Red Sea. 
that's 136 degrees. There's a failed rift system up here in Canada. Um, there's uh, about 100 and uh, there's about 120 some odd degrees here between this branch of the Graben and, and here. Um, but this seems to be a characteristic of rift systems. In fact, um, the angle between this rift system is 135 degrees. This one was 136. The uh, Eurasian plate in the Persian Gulf, that fault system is 135 degrees. Uh, I think this is, a, is an unsolved problem uh, in uh, geophysics. Um, and so, of course, it was very intriguing that you have these collection of rift systems in this corner of the, uh, of the world. And so I thought I could do some experimental research on this and try to understand why we always get this characteristic 135 degree angle. So as you know, I work for a very large institution with a lot of resources that we could bring to bear on an experimental problem like this. Uh, so I boiled an egg. <laughs> now, an egg is kind of a good analog here because an egg has a brittle outer shell and uh, beneath that shell is a def deformable albumin, uh, and beneath that a yolk. And of course, if you put the egg carefully in boiling water, what happens is the interior heats up and expands. It'll approach its maximum tangential stress in about four, five, six minutes, something like that. Uh, and the response to that tangential stress is it's going to crack. So you can see this one here cracked in a series of linear quasi-linear segments here, here, and here. And that's a little bit more than 125 degrees. On this one, you can figure easily, this one cracked uh, on the other. This is actually the same egg. I could only afford to do this once. I, <laughs> I don't personally enjoy hard-boiled eggs, but my wife does. So. Um, and this is the other side of that egg, and you see three cracks. And these are pretty close to 120 degrees each. So. Um, it would be great if you could solve this problem. Uh, if you solve it in geophysics, you'll probably get a paper in, in nature out of it. Um, if you solve it for the egg industry, I think it's worth about a billion dollars. <laughs> uh, because they lose about a percent of all the eggs that they wash. Uh, and I think it's about a billion dollars in loss. So you wouldn't be the richest man in the world, but you're sure to make the Forbes list of 1,400. All right. So now I want to know what a continental rift looks like magnetically. And so here is a great example. Off the coast of North America, there is what is called the East Coast Magnetic Anomaly. Uh, and so here's the actual magnetic field data. You don't see so much of the lineations here. Uh, the resolution in this map is not adequate to, uh, to follow uh, all of those lineated features. Uh, but you can see here, and it's been mapped out uh, by these authors, uh, Leblay et al., uh, published uh, 2010. Um, of course, it was once part of the same continent, uh, Africa and North America, and uh, a continental rift developed, and they separated over time. Uh, you can see them getting a little further apart here. So it turns out that this segmented magnetic anomaly can be found both off the coast of North America and off the coast of Africa over here. Uh, and so now this same anomaly is on either side of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, 200 million years of, of crustal uh, seafloor spreading has separated the continents this much. Um, but if we look again at this magnetic anomaly, uh, curiously enough, uh, this pair of segments makes an angle 124 degrees. There's 139 and 136 again. So, uh, I think this lineated, uh, segmented anomaly uh, is a signature of uh, an ancient continental rift that separated uh, the one continent and made several continents from them. So now we're back to my magnetic field map of, of Mars. And this map is constructed at 400 kilometers altitude. We would, we would love to do better. So um, it turns out we can do better. And this is an example of our pass at 100 kilometers, one of those I showed you before. And this is what it looks like at 400 kilometers. And what you see here is the continuation of a potential field. As you get further away, you see the longer spatial wavelengths. And the shorter spatial wavelengths are attenuated. 
But that doesn't mean that they're not still there at 400 kilometers. It just means they're attenuated. And you remember I said we had fantastic signal to noise. So perhaps we can pick this signal out of the signal we see at 400 kilometers. Uh, this is what the magnetic field would look like in plane projection. Uh, but I don't want to spend much time on it. I want to go uh, directly here and just illustrate that, um, yes, if you are at a specific altitude, say 100 kilometers, um, that will dominate the wavelength that you see. But with sufficient signal to noise, you can climb down this curve, and you can see much shorter wavelength features. So how do we do that? Well, uh, there's a technique called uh, analytic continuation. There are some other techniques, but I'm going to talk about analytic continuation. Uh, you can do a two-dimensional Fourier analysis uh, of the uh, data in a, in a section, uh, and you can continue that upward or downward. And now the problem with that in uh, geophysics is that small spatial uh, noise uh, on your data, when you continue that down, it, it, it is amplified exponentially. So it's tricky to do it. You try to go downward in downward continuation, and everything gets noisy. So I'm going to show you a method that we uh, stumbled into by uh, some colleagues uh, Zhu et al. in geophysical prospecting. Um, and this is just an example of how well it works. Off to the left is a model field, because we need something to compare to. So we constructed a model. And we can calculate the field anywhere. So this is what it looks like uh, up at 400 kilometers. It's just a magnetized slab. This is what it should look like down at uh, 200 kilometers. Over on the far right is direct Fourier continuation. And like I said, if you have a tiny bit of noise on the data, it is amplified exponentially going down. And then you wind up with artifacts all over the place. And the real problem with that is when you look at a map like that, you don't know what are artifacts and what is real. So not very useful. Now, but this iterative technique is very clever. You don't actually downward continue anything. You just guess at what the field is down there, and you upward continue it. And as long as you have a way to improve the guess, you'll eventually get the right answer. And so that's what we do. Um, and it kind of goes like this. This is not just a cut across the data. Um, here's the data at 400 kilometers. Um, and, and this is what it should look like at 100. And so we start off and we say, OK, we're just going to guess that the field down there is the same as what we measure up high. So you put that down there. That's this dashed line here, the initial well, the solid line, the initial guess. And you upward continue that. Well, you attenuate the hell out of it, and it comes out pretty flat. So then the next guess is you just add the difference back in. You upward continue that. And you do that a bunch of times, and sure enough, before you've gone too far, you've actually reproduced what we know the field to be down there by this method of iterative upward continuation. OK. So here we are with what we published in 2005, these putative transform faults. And we want to downward continue this data and see if the faults are still there. OK. Uh, so we're going to apply this method. And uh, here they come. So downward continued to um, 100 kilometers altitude. What you see is uh, we have a smaller spatial scale, more stripes. Some of these fat stripes are now a combination of thinner stripes. So we've improved our spatial resolution. You can see still the, uh, the uh, fault, the displacement of the field along that same line uh, that we uh, found in the 400 kilometers data. In fact, I'll go and put the lines back on there. Um, and, and so we're pretty happy here, because we've not only been able to improve the resolution of the data, but we haven't uh, destroyed the uh, areas here where we know there is essentially no field. OK. So now we would like to do that over the entire planet. And what you're what you're seeing is a slow evolution as we go slow, uh, more uh, closer and closer to the surface of Mars. We're going to go from 400 down to 100. As we do that, you see more features come into view. You see more spatial resolution. You see more uh, striping. And we're getting pretty close there now. <laughs> 
And I'm sure you now see a new fault that is evident in this data as we have downward continued it. It's pretty convincing. You also see more lineations uh, throughout the entire crust. You see a better correspondence with Vallis marinaris and the magnetic features that flank it. Actually, there's another uh, diminution of the field here. We still have the same large regions of volcanic uh, emplacements that are demagnetized. You can see another fault right here that was not obvious before. These are the ones that we saw previously. Uh, and I'm now going to switch between a shaded topography map and the magnetic map so that you can look in detail at the correspondence between the magnetic map and some of the features. Uh, for example, this red block here is a raised block of crust uh, relative to the yellowish area here. That's a very significant elevation rise. Um, that is not seen so much in the 400 kilometer data, but after we've downward continued it, you can see a very clear demarcation that corresponds to that raised block. Uh, there are many, many other features um, that you can look at as you switch between these. Uh, this, is that, uh, this is obviously a fault that has uh, subsequently been uh, occupied by a, a, a flow pattern of some sort. Um, that is also now evident in the separation of the magnetic field pattern. Um, see if I can find some more for you here. The, uh, the volcanic emplacements just to the west of Isidus, this is a volcanic emplacement here, another volcanic emplacement here. Uh, you will see those, you see them here actually at 400 kilometers, you will see them better as a, as a lack of field in this region and a lack of field here in this region as well. Uh, take a look at this sharp feature down here. You'll see that follows the topography in the elevation map. This sharp bite out here, you don't see it so much in the 400, but at 100 kilometers, it, it's clear that the downward continue data is, uh, is giving us better resolution and better correspondence with features we can see in the topography of, of Mars. Let's see what else I have. Oh, yes. So uh, I went looking for 135 degree angles because as we've seen, it looks like continents like to pull apart with fault segments joined by 135 degree angles. Uh, so in addition to the very beautiful fault uh, that, that uh, appeared in the downward continued data, we also see, uh, this again is 135 degrees over here as well. Uh, several places uh, in, this, in this map that have the same characteristic uh, segmented geometry that is characteristic of continental rifting. Um, so I think, I think we have more evidence that uh, the magnetic imprint on Mars uh, is telling us something about plate tectonics and the early evolution of the crust. So I think I have uh, run out of my time, and, and I thank you all for your patience. Um, but we are, uh, just uh, in, in summary, uh, I think with this, uh, with this new technique, we can improve uh, it's almost a, another mission for free. It's as if we can fly now a mission at 100 kilometers uh, and look at this revised map and uh, try to understand how the plates actually evolved when they formed uh, 4 billion years ago on Mars. Thank you. <laughs>